In 2006, the FBI even got their hands on the case. And while they have had a few persons of interest in their sites, of which they have not released, they claim that more evidence is needed in order to move in any sort of direction with the case. In 2015, a forensic investigator offered his services free of charge to Bob and Deb and offered to conduct an independent search of the house that Kristen was renting a room from at the time of her disappearance. Along with his skill set, he brought along his cadaver dog, world-renowned for being able to alert bodies long since dead, dating back to even World War II. So the forensic investigator and his cadaver dog were brought to the house, and the dog immediately headed straight to the basement, where he alerted the investigators of the presence of human remains. Investigator Paul Dosti and forensic anthropologist Dr. Arpad Voss both confirmed that the tests they performed on the basement soil samples collected confirmed human decomposition was present in the area. When this information was presented to the Oakland investigators, they concluded that they would need to conduct tests of their own in order to move forward with this information. There has been no update or word as to how that is going for them. During the same year, Kristen's sister Allison went public pleading for suspected killer Robert Durst to, quote, come clean with any information he may have regarding her sister's case. It seems like this was pretty much out of left field for the investigation, in my opinion, but it appears it stems from the sighting of Kristen in the mall that day with a blonde woman. Durst owned a home in the Bay Area at the time and was known to be a cross-dresser. It seems like a stretch, but the theory gained attraction with Kristen's family, and while the police have rejected the idea, the FBI involved have taken it into consideration and refused to completely rule it out. Now, I decided to climb into a rabbit hole and dig a little further than what was on the surface, and I came up with even more information. Now, I thought we had heard the last of John Onuma, but some articles said otherwise. One source stated that when police searched John's apartment, they found one of those calendars that has the individual days to flip through rather than just a whole month on one page. And the dates, June 23rd and June 24th, were torn out. Kristen was last seen on June 23rd. This immediately gave me chills, but oh, wait, it gets worse. Jill agrees to go on camera. You remember Jill, his girlfriend at the time. She agrees to go on camera for an interview with her face blurred out, and she claims that on June 23rd, she was, quote, at the library. It doesn't say which library, and there's no further context, but I found this intriguing, so I did a Google search, and it pulled dozens of libraries in the area as close as four minutes from the mall that Kristen worked at. This caught my attention because the day Kristen vanished, she was carrying a green Jansport backpack containing her camera and library books, which, yeah, I know that's not out of the box for a college student to have in their bag, but... If you also remember, I stated that she had signed up for classes at the YMCA, the same company Jill had been fired from and that John had allegedly used as fuel to call in the tip about Kristen being killed by lesbians. It's a lot of random little tidbits that feed into the theory that John and Jill were involved. When I read this, I instantly had the feeling of like a lion stalking its prey. That's just what popped into my head. I just couldn't shake the feeling that Kristen had been being watched without even knowing. It's just my personal couch detective gut feeling. But wait, there's still more. So after John is discovered in Hawaii, after the America's Most Wanted running and the tip coming in, and he heads back to San Francisco to perform that lie detector test, the property owner of where he was staying at is like, fuck you, get out of my house. So when John comes back to Hawaii, he tells the manager, Hey, I hid something in the attic of the house. Can I please just retrieve it? It's super important to me. And the manager is like, nah, beat it, fuckface. This badass manager goes and hunts down this, quote, valuable item from the attic. And it's a briefcase. He opens it and it has tons of articles about Kristen's disappearance in it. I was like, boom, arrest this man. Like, if this is actually true, I'd head down there and perform a citizen's arrest myself. I mean, it doesn't get that much more incriminating unless you found Kristen in the damn attic. So sometime in 2012, Jill's health starts to deteriorate. She claims that it's stemming from, like, a bunch of random 
bad energy she's been hanging on to for years. She contacts her uncle and spills like a bunch of random guts to him, most of which was irrelevant, but she makes one key statement that stands out. She tells him that she had dated a controlling man at one point and that he convinced her to assist in an unspeakable kidnap and murder. What? I've watched a clip of the America's Most Wanted segment of Kristen's case, and the investigator said that there were many, many inconsistencies with John's story when they initially spoke to him about the call he made. They said that they just need to find the connection that puts him from person of interest to a convicted murderer. The only other publicly noted person of interest in this case is a man named Matthew Luke. Information on him is kind of hard to come by, but there are a few suspicious strings tying him to this case, one being Jill Lampo. He is Jill's former boyfriend, who she dated prior to John Onuma. And oddly enough, he began working at Spinelli's literally three days after Kristen went missing. The FBI has remained extremely tight-lipped regarding Luke, but something intriguing I found when on findkristen.com is an email was sent to an active investigator on the case claiming that they are carefully handling Luke and that while they cannot call him a suspect, he too is also at the center of this investigation. That same investigator went back to Spinelli's to interview all workers that knew Kristen roughly, I think like six months to a year after her disappearance, all of which were available to talk and question, except for one guy who was unavailable because he had quit about three months after her disappearance. Co-workers luckily knew that he was close friends with none other than Luke. They gave the investigator Luke's number, and he attempted to reach out to Luke for this man's number, before he, but before he could even ask, Luke basically ripped the guy's head off saying he knew nothing about the case and to leave him alone, and subsequently hung up. Now we're on to the theories that I have for this case. This one is a tough one. Very rarely am I ever torn between two completely different schools of thought, but this case does have me a little torn between two directions. Maybe one more so than the other, but that all depends on the validity of the information that I have. Like most unsolved cases, the information released to the public that has actually been verified is factual, is limited, and that's in an attempt to preserve the integrity of the investigation, which is a good thing. However, it doesn't rep prevent rumor mills from milling away and all the suggested theories and ideas that get weaved into facts and create convoluted yet interesting junk. So it's hard to decipher, but for argument's sake, we will run with the assumption that all this information is factual and we will go from there. So the most obvious and popular theory is that John Onuma and Jill Lampo were in on it. Based on the given evidence, I say absolutely. Not only did John insert himself directly into the vet investigation by calling in a phony tip with the flimsy-ass excuse of revenge on his girlfriend's co-workers, which to me sounds so fucking stupid, slash tires, write a shitty review, or file a complaint at their place of employment, implicating them in a disappearance and murder of a local girl, and to give descriptive locations of where the body can be found just seems too fucking real to not be true. On top of that, he lived practically within arm's reach of her last known location. His girlfriend, having previously worked at a YMCA, potentially the same YMCA that our victim signed up to take classes at, the library book weirdness, and most importantly, John's violent past and ten tendency to stalk prey through personal ads, of which Kristen may have created an ad or responded to an ad for friends. Chalk up the torn diary pages and calendar pages found in both Jill and John's places and the weird briefcase stashed away with articles of Kristen's disappearance and Jill's confession to her uncle. It would be impossible for them not to be involved. The police can't even rule them out off the list of suspects. For me, this is the most solid of leads in this case, but there are other avenues and let's explore those as well. Theory 2 kind of gains traction with the later discovery of evidence through independent investigations separate from the police. Many people find it weird that Kristen's roommates didn't really report her missing until several, several days had passed. 
Some threads of Reddit with people claiming to be from Charlotte state that the parents weren't actually ever notified by the roommates and that they themselves were concerned and flew out there to find out that she was missing, at which point they were the ones who went to the police station and filed the report. If this is true, it does paint the roommates in a different light, but not necessarily at fault in my opinion. Police interviewed them and felt their accounts were sufficient enough to cross them off the list. There are no public claims of from Bob or Deb that they feel the roommates know more than they are saying or anything like that. But the glaringly obvious issue with these guys is the basement of the house, obviously. For cadaver dogs to hit on decomp in a basement and further testing to confirm that the results in a house of a missing woman is just suspicious as hell. If you recall, a co-worker stated that Kristen had said she was headed home that day. Police only ruled this out when her scent was located at the beach. But I feel like that isn't sufficient enough to say that she didn't go to the beach and then return home at some point. She lived roughly an hour away across the bay in Oakland, which is a mission, but as we know, that didn't stop Kristen from doing anything. Many people felt that she, the disappearing scent at the ocean ledge further fed the idea that she fell into the water. But a Reddit poster brought up an interesting idea that maybe the scent was traced nowhere else because she took the same route back to the bus that took her home. It is completely possible, and it is something I hadn't considered until I had read that comment. Up until that point, I just assumed that she hitched a ride with someone, which is also completely possible since she was prone to doing that. But again, we can't rule that out. Now, weirdly enough, the decomp basement seemed to be written off by some more public sources by the fact that Kristen's residence was next door to a halfway house for juvenile probation violators. It felt like they were chalking up the hits to that, which I'm sorry, but A, that seems like a completely separate issue within itself, but B, explain to me how the fuck that works. You're insinuating that juvenile probationers are killing people in the basement next door to their house and nothing is being done about this? Okay. <laughs> However, the house itself has a strange past. Again, this is the house next door to Kristen's. It was apparently a convalescent hospital in the 60s before shutting down and reopening as a plethora of shit, including a pit bull breeding and fighting ring, a rabbit slaughterhouse, a meth lab, a home to several roach coaches that were eventually seized for selling drugs and poisoning Laney College students, and lastly, a grid home for 5150s and, quote, youth with gender issues. If this is the case, it does make one wonder if something could have possibly happened from that house that would ping in the basement. Like, maybe the property was laid out differently and their house was a part of that patch of land. I don't know. I couldn't find anything on that, but it throw it in there on the heap of shit that we're assuming at this point. Which brings us to the last-ish theory, which is her falling over the edge at Sutra Beach. All locals have kind of debunked the idea that this area is super populated and that someone would have 100% seen her go over. I've never personally been to San Francisco. I do know that it's like a hot tourist trap area. But apparently this area in particular is not only known for the violent waves, but also for coastal fog and being very cold and icky, especially during this time of year that it happened, which is the beginning of summer. Apparently, shorts and t-shirts will have you begging for warmer clothing even in the summer. Some believe that considering she had her camera with her that day that she headed there, it was pretty deserted considering it was a Monday, and that she took advantage of climbing the cliffy rocks there and had an accident. To them, it would explain why her scent never leaves the beach and how no one has come forward with info despite the big reward put out for information. It's a logical explanation and a solid theory, but again, it's not the one that my gut is going with. Now, sadly, this case still remains open and, and unsolved with little to no information coming in. However, it has brought to light a glaring issue with how missing persons cases are handled and supported. The National Center for Missing Adults is what handles the, the support of missing adults across the nation for persons over the age of 18. And they are severely disadvantaged resource-wise when compared to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Deb has felt that this is a change that needs to happen. 
Because her daughter had turned 18 just three weeks before going missing, she was denied resources that could have made up for the lack of an active investigation in the early days.